Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Savant Report podcast. I've got my great friend and macro guru, Dr. Jeff Ross, with us again today. Lots of big headlines that we want to talk about. Dr. Jeff Ross, thank you so much for coming on for us again. Hey, my pleasure, Jordan. Thanks for having me back. Well, um, listen, I'm I, I'm really curious to get your take on today's inflation report. September up 0.4% month over month. Uh, that is huge. Uh, and we're at an 8.2% year over year figure. Um, Jeff, the markets are just rolling over. What, wh where do we go from here? I mean, is this the same story that we're, we're just waiting for lower lows? Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, that's the short answer, right? The easy answer is as long as inflation remains sticky high, and it clearly is, right? We got we, today's CPI numbers. Yesterday's PPI was also high year over year, sticky high. I like to say sticky high um, because that's what it is. It's just kind of stuck in this range here. And, uh, and until uh, inflation starts to come down, the Fed is just going to continue raising rates. And as they raise rates and remain hawkish, they're doing this into an inevitable recession and they're making it all worse. So, so the economy is already starting to feel some major strains. We're obviously seeing the effects in the risk markets and you know, just in general across major asset classes. So what's real estate doing? What are equities doing? What are bonds doing? All of these things. And then you factor in the fact that um, be, despite all of this going on, all of these major asset classes are coming off record high valuations. So that's another important point that people kind of tend to forget. At some point, record high valuations need to revert back to the mean and get back down to more normal levels. At the end of 2021, real estate, bonds, especially bonds, and stocks, especially stocks, were at record high valuations based on lots of different metrics that I like to look at. And so these things do not last. At some point, that's those are signs of froth, signs of a bubble. Um, those things have to correct. So you have all of these factors, record high valuations, heading into a recession, super hawkish Fed because inflation is so high. All of those things are terrible for risk assets and for you know price action of risk assets. So that's the long answer. Short answer, yes, lower. I think I think things will continue to move lower. I, I've been saying, I think uh, the NASDAQ, for, that's one of the things I like to follow because I'm kind of a growth tech innovation kind of guy. Uh, that's how I like to invest. I like to invest in those things in bull markets. These are the things to short in bear markets or at the very least avoid, get out of during bear markets. Um, the NASDAQ hit a high of around 16,000 way back in November of 2021. I think it gets down to at least 8,000. I've been saying this for a while now. Um, I got laughed at when I was saying it earlier on because it was still like 11,000, 12,000 when I started saying this. Now we're down to the low 10,000s. We're actually getting close to 8,000. It's starting to look believable, especially after today's price movement. So um, I think we have lower to go. My outlook in general on this is that the Fed is going to keep tightening the screws until we see disorder or dysfunction in the bond markets. And uh, and I, I'll, I'll kind of slow down here, but, but we saw a little bit of that, a taste of that with the Bank of England last week and the pension uh, debacle. Um, so uh, that's the kind of thing that starts to happen. And um, I'm watching that most closely. The Fed isn't watching the stock market. They're not saying, okay, once NASDAQ is down 50%, we'll go back to quantitative easing. What they do is they watch for one inflation, yes, uh, unemployment, yes, but what they're really looking at is, is there disorder in the bond markets? And if there is disorder in the bond markets, they'll have to step in. So so that's what I'm kind of watching for. So, so effectively, they have to break something systemically for them to say, okay, we're done. Yes. And they would never say that, right? That would be bad. Uh, that would look bad if they said that. It'd be bad <laughs> right. PR. If they said, we're going to keep tightening the screws until the bond market breaks and gets disorderly and the people and you know the, the financial markets are in complete turmoil and panic. What they're saying is we're focused on CPI. We'd like to see that down to 2%. They're never going to get there. Not anytime soon. Um, and, um, and we'd like to, you know, we think unemployment's going to go higher. We'd like to see that. We're going to destroy demand. And those are kind of acceptable things to say. It's not acceptable to say, we're going to basically just devastate the bond market before we get back into QE infinity again. But that's exactly what they're going to do, right? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I don't think they step in until then. <laughs> you know, um, I, I got to tell you, 8,000 uh, NASDAQ was a pretty big call. 
Um, you know, Jeff, are you at liberty at all to discuss? You manage a hedge fund. Are you able to discuss the positioning of your hedge fund going into all this? Sure, sure. So I've been wildly bearish uh, going into this, and and um, I I'll just say that I was I was strongly strongly net short. Uh, I have been for many months now, uh, and I actually just lightened up. So I'm still heavily net short. And when I say net short, what am I shorting? I'm shorting Nasdaq stocks. Um, Bitcoin futures, actually. Uh, the only thing I'm long are a couple oil and gas stocks, which are the which is basically the only sector that has maintained kind of bullish momentum throughout all of this, and then really heavily uh, positioned in cash right now. So I took some profits recently, just actually uh, yesterday, in my Nasdaq short, um, just because it was already getting really oversold, and so I don't like to get too greedy. So we still hold a pretty heavy net short position in all of those things, um, but. But uh, and I think I think we could I think this could like I said I'm expecting the Nasdaq to go down to you know eight thousand so there's still quite a ways to go there's still another what's that a twenty percent drop at least from kind of current levels twenty five percent very possible so um, what but what happens nothing goes down in a straight line so usually what we get is we see these these big kind of plunges down and then we have a little bit of a relief rally and then plunges down and so I use that because I do a little bit of active trading in my funds and for my Veilshire clients so when we get back to kind of um, higher, kind of more overbought levels again, that's when I'll press the shorts again and go short again. So um, that's my game plan for now. Uh, and I have a I have a working game plan for months from now too, based on kind of what the, the Fed does based on these bond markets breaking, uh, things like that. We'll, we'll see what happens, but, but I have a game plan. Okay. So I want to talk about the game plan, but before we get to the game plan, I want to touch on, you said you were short Bitcoin futures. Really? Doctor, I mean, that is just, uh, (laughs) that's a big thing to say, even publicly, especially because I'm so those Bitcoiners, right? They like the maxis are going to hate. Yes. Oh yeah. I mean, so I do. So here's, here's how I am. I wear two hats and I talk about this all the time, just to be super clear personally, individually for myself and for my family, all I do is dollar cost average into Bitcoin. Every Wednesday, I make a purchase on Swan Bitcoin. Every once in a while, I smash buy on some other places. But I, I, I just accumulate Bitcoin regardless of price. I don't care what it does to my net worth if it goes down a lot. I don't care about the volatility. I just want to accumulate Bitcoin slowly and steadily over time. That's me personally. And that's what I recommend, by the way, to 99% of the people. I think nobody should be trading or very few people should actually trade Bitcoin. I think most people should just view it as better money. This is your savings. You slowly transfer your US dollars or whatever currency you're in into Bitcoin because that's a much better store of value over the long run. That's that. So that's my that's my official recommendation for people. What do I do with Veilshire? Veilshire, I'm a risk manager, right? I run a hedge fund. I run uh, separately managed accounts. I have, you know, I don't know, 160 or so accounts now, client accounts. Um, I manage risk. Those clients don't want to see their portfolios go, go down 75% because Bitcoin is down 75% or more if you're talking about other kind of risky assets, right? Shopify is still down about 80%. Um, those kind of things. Bitcoin miners, which I like, they're down 85 to 90%. Um, I'm okay with that personally. My clients are not. They don't pay me money to watch their accounts go down 70 to 90%. So I manage risk. So what I do in my Veilshire portfolio is I have a long-term trading system that I personally developed. I spent years and years working on it. It basically takes my macro views and then couples it with momentum strategies and volatility of the different asset classes that I invest in. And, And so what that means is when something, so when I have a macro view right now, I'm bearish. And then I have uh, it, it correlates with asset classes that I want to be invested in and that the momentum is clearly bearish uh, and everything is all aligned. Then we go into those and we go big into those. I'm, I'm more of a believer into, you know, uh, only hold a few eggs in your basket and watch that basket closely. Yep. Uh, that whole motto, that's kind of how I think. I want to generate the most alpha possible uh, in the in the asset classes that I'm most comfortable with, that I understand the most. And when all of those things align, my macro views, momentum, volatility, we go big uh, and we get rewarded for it when we do that. So, so talk to me about price targets on Bitcoin. If you are short Bitcoin, uh, leveraged short Bitcoin in the futures market, um, tell me what you think the bottom might be for Bitcoin. You've called 8,000 NASDAQ. I think I've even seen some tweets from you that have said, you know, that's kind of target one <laughs> for uh, for shorting the NASDAQ. 
Um, talk to us about maybe Target too, and then you know maybe a Target for Bitcoin on the on the lower end. So it does sound like you think that there will be a final leg down in not just risk assets but Bitcoin as well. Probably, and I'm glad you you made that distinction. I think you and I both understand Bitcoin to a level where we don't see it as a risk asset, but the yep. market still trades it like a risk asset because the market, the majority of market participants still don't understand Bitcoin. They still think of it like a crypto, or they still think of it like a small tech tech stock. They don't understand that it's simply better money. That it's actually literally the world's best safe haven asset. So, with that caveat. I don't use price targets really for Bitcoin. What, I, what I'm what i more focused on is where is the, the momentum pointing? Where is volatility pointing? Right now, it's still pointing lower. Uh, so, could, so, I, so I like to think in terms of possibilities and probabilities. Could Bitcoin go back to its, its previous recent low of like 17.6? Absolutely. In fact, I think it probably will go that low. Uh, will it break that? Could it go lower? Could it, could it wick down to 14,000, 13,000, 10,000, sub 10,000? Sure, but I think it would be very short lived if it does that. I would think of that as sort of a capitulation type event, kind of like what we saw back in 2018, where it was hovering around 6,000 for a really long time, kind of frustrating people. People were getting bored, volatility really uh, came down. And then all of a sudden it dumped 50% down to like 3,000, right? And everybody was panicking, everybody was selling. The OGs among us were that we use that as a buying opportunity. That was a fantastic time. And so I actually think, based on the macro setup, because things are so ugly, that there is a chance it gets that low again. Wow. I would like to caveat all of this, by the way, to say, so a couple of things. My system doesn't pick bottoms or time bottoms. What it does is it confirms bottoms. So at some point, Bitcoin will bottom. At some point, you know, equities will bottom. I don't know what price that will be, but at some point, the momentum will shift from bearish to bullish. And literally, you'll see me that day, like on Twitter, I, I say, you know, Dr. Jeff Ross, aka Dr. Bear. I will literally shift my Twitter profile that day and I'm saying, I'm going to say I'm Dr. Bull again, you know, or something like that. Uh, and I'm getting bullish again. And so um, I don't know when that's going to happen. I think it happens when, once it breaks and it, so it's not until after that where, uh, where we have this bottom and then this shift and we turn back bullish again. My playbook, if I can get into this a little bit, because I've yes. been thinking a lot about this recently, is I've gone back and spent a lot of time studying the last couple of major recessions. So by major recessions, I mean the dot-com crash, 2000 to 2002, and then the great the global financial crisis, 2006 to 2009. I know you're hev you are heavily in real estate then, so you know that very well. You're, you're familiar with that. What happened, and this is super interesting, is the Fed was in a rate hiking cycle from 2004 to 2006, and they and they rose, they, they were raising rates, and towards the end of that cycle, equities started to plummet. And it wasn't until it was July 2006 that the Fed paused. So they were raising rates, they paused their rate heights, and I think it was around the Fed funds rate was about 5.25% when they paused. Like the moment they paused, the markets took that as a positive signal and risk assets rallied. And I just put charts out yesterday that showed this from July when they pivoted of 2006 through the end of October 2007, the NASDAQ rose about 52%. So it rallied really hard. In August of 2007, the Fed was realizing there are serious problems in the financial system. So as equities were ripping higher, the bond market was still like, no, this is, there's, there are serious issues. There are, there are problems. Um, kind of like what we're seeing today, the bond market is, is signaling major problems. So as equities were rising, bonds were still showing signs of trouble. The Fed actually pivoted flat out and went to QE. They started lowering rates rapidly in August of 2007. In October of 2007, I hope I'm not confusing people with the dates, but October of 2007, equities peaked, and then they began their, they began their long, famous descent, which didn't end all the way until March of 2009 at those just crazy lows. That's when it felt like the world was ending, um, and the Fed was doing all these crazy things. You know, that's when TARP uh, came out, and all, you know, these, 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 uh, these amazing policies to try to kind of uh, stop the financial system from absolutely crumbling and falling apart. I think we're going to see a similar type scenario this time around, uh, but it's going to happen more quickly because the Fed is moving much more quickly this time around. They're raising rates really fast. They have inflation to deal with this time, which wasn't as big of a problem last time. Uh, we have much more debt on our books this time around. That's a problem. Um, so I just think things are going to move faster. So all that said, that's that's the uh, that's the baseline. What is my playbook? I'm waiting for the Fed to pivot. I think at some point, 
the credit markets are going to become so unstable that the Fed is going to be forced to get back into quantitative easing again. At the very least, the first thing they're going to do is they're going to pause the rate hike. So I'm listening for language from Powell and from the FOMC people to say, you know what, we, we think we've raised them high enough. We're going to stop now and we're going to pause. We're going to watch to see the effects of what we've done. I think once they say that, that's going to be a trigger to the market that risk assets are ready to go again. So we're going to see a surge in risk assets. That includes Bitcoin, even though it's not a risk asset. Um, and it, it includes crypto probably too, even though I'm not into crypto. I think all of those things rip higher uh, until then the Fed, the, this, that's that signal too. That's that's round two. The last signal will be the Fed being like, you know what? The, the bond markets are still signaling massive trouble. There are serious problems. We're going to see sovereign nations default. Uh, we're going to see uh, lots of corporations go bankrupt. Uh, I'm watching things like credit default swaps for things and all of those things continue to rip higher, both at the nation state level and at the corporate level as well. Um, as those things continue, we're going to start seeing one by one um, big institutions fall that are systemically important, meaning that systemically important just means that are at a high risk for causing contagion. Uh, so that can bring down other institutions as one of those dominoes falls. So when that happens, the Fed will do QE again, they'll be they'll rapidly lower rates again. That's when the market's going to be like, oh man, this is serious. Like there are serious problems. And then I think we get the real problem. We're going to see a serious recession in the US. We're, ta we're talking probably 2023 at this point. Uh, and risk assets, I think, then take a hard fall at that point and they go down fast, kind of like fourth quarter of 2008 and first quarter of 2009. Boom. Okay. So I want to, I, I, I love you spilling your playbook to, to all of our viewers. Thank you for that. Sure. Um, so let's let's talk about this. If we were to chart this, we're talking about the Fed is going to continue to raise rates into the end of 2022, right? Maybe early 2023. They pause. So risk assets are, are probably going to spike, right? We're going to think, great, bear market's over. Fed's had its day. They're done. And then we're going to see the systemic problems just explode, right? Yes. Do we put in a lower low in equities and risk yes. assets from that point? Yes, so I the, think so. So your belief is that the Fed pivot is not the buy signal. It's a trade buy signal, but it's not the ultimate buy signal. It's not the bottom indicator. That's the way to think about it. So the Fed pause. So wait till they stop raising rates. That's the pause. We get a bullish move in risk assets. Most people are going to think we've we've gotten through the worst of it, but watch the bond. Greg Foss always says, watch the credit markets, right? That's the tail that wags, that's the dog that wags the tail and the tail is the equities markets. We got to watch the credit market. If the credit market still looks sick, how can you tell? Credit default swaps are still rising. The yield curve remains still inverted or something is wrong with the yield curve instead of its normal upward slope like it's supposed to have. If that still looks ugly and things are still moving in the wrong direction, that means we're not over it yet. The other important thing is it takes a while for the, as you know, especially as a real estate investor, it takes a while for things like rate hikes to work themselves through the system. So real estate is a lagging indicator. Why? Because you hike rates and then you have to wait for those effects to work out. It, the effects eventually get shown in, right? The 30 year um, yeah. uh, mortgage rates, fixed mortgage rates, things like that. And then eventually people are like, hey, these rates are pretty high. I can't afford houses like I used to. And then people who are selling their houses for exorbitant levels realize we can't do that anymore. And they have to ratchet down their sale price and it gets lower and lower. And so we, at one point we had a uh, supply shortage. Now we have, we're starting to get supply surpluses basically because the demand just isn't yeah. there. Um, that it takes a while, a while to work all that out. So even if the Fed begins lowering rates again, which I fully expect them to do uh, probably in 2023, um, it will still take time for those effects to work themselves through throughout the system. And that's why I think it's delayed from there where we finally see lower lows in all of these asset classes. So, you know, it's interesting. You talk about timing uh, of these things working their way through the system. And I've talked about real estate in that exact context for months now. Um, I This is one of the reasons why I hate year over year figures, not just in real estate, but also in inflation, right? We're comparing September, 2022 to September, 2021. And yes, it's still elevated, but arguably a lot of the inflation um, over the last six months has really come out. And, and that's why I'm shocked to see a 0.4% month over month 
inflation rate. I mean, to me, that is staggering. And I'm I'm, I'm trying to understand. I, I didn't read uh, up on it too much before we started our podcast this morning because the headlines just came out. But as I think through it, I mean, I think about the the state of the economy today compared to what it was six months ago. And just looking at supply chains, looking at demand and demand destruction that has been prevalent everywhere that I can see from used vehicles to uh, energy to um, real estate. I mean, the, the, the real estate transactions are way, way, way down. Where is that inflation coming from? So a couple of things, the, the primary driver is the OER, right? Owner's equivalent rent. So costs of rent are a huge factor in these inflation metrics. Again, very lagging indicators. And what we're seeing there is that as home prices have risen so much prior to prior to this recent uh, decline, right? They were just out of control, 20% year over year and, and on average around the nation. That's just like way too fast for real estate to rise, as you know. Um, and so, but, but renters, uh, the renters were not being charged the equivalent increases in their rental rates. That was that's even lagging further behind real estate prices, and so that still has time. Those are still rising. In fact, I just saw a recent stat, which would, would be interesting to you here in Colorado Springs. Um, rental rates year over year rose forty seven point five percent. Forty seven point five percent on average. Can you imagine wow. being a renter? You were paying a thousand bucks a month. Now you're paying mm -hmm. almost fifteen hundred bucks uh, bucks a month, just like that. Like that's what happened to people here in the Springs where I'm from. That's a that's a unique case, but it's not unheard of. And that kind of stuff is happening all over America right now. So what's happening is people who own real estate, they're seeing their valuations drop, but they maybe have been kind of nice about uh, not raising rent too much on their their renters. Uh -huh. Now they're like, you know what? I'm hurting. Gas is expensive. Groceries are expensive. I'm having a hard time paying my bills. I have to raise uh, rental rates on my on my uh, my renters because I need to survive. And so now you're getting that tug of war thing going. So that's just a very, very delayed indicator that has a huge effect on, um, on inflation, on CPI, things like that. Food costs also, they had come down, but they're starting to creep higher again. Um, so that's a big component. Gas, we all know oil, and, and this is the other interesting thing, still 0.4% higher month over month, even though oil was way down from its highs of in the 120s, it fell all the way at the at in September, it was all the way down in um, like $80 and less a barrel for a time. Now that's creeping back up since then it's actually back up in the 90 ish dollar a barrel range. So that means next month oil is going to play a major factor in the CPI again, that'll be another thing keeping CPI sticky high as well. So this is not going to end anytime soon, even though we're seeing demand destruction, we're seeing prices come down. There's still a lot of other forces at bay this whole worldwide movement from peak centralization to slow decentralization. Um, that is very inflationary for sure. War is the most inflationary thing you can have and and having russia and the ukraine go at it um that is massively inflationary you know not to mention just the horrible cost of human suffering which is just which is terrible but that puts pr upwards pressure on oil natural gas prices it puts huge upward pressure on food costs they're huge wheat producers they produce lots of other important things both nations do um so more upward pressure uh, on prices so i expect again that inflation is going to be higher for longer unless and this is the big unless until this system breaks and we have a deflationary bust and what does that mean that means basically there's so much panic that basically there are no more buyers in the system everybody's hitting sell businesses are basically frozen they're not ordering products anymore ordering supplies anymore it can happen really suddenly i like to say slowly at first then all at once it's a common mantra in the finance world and that's how it happens slowly at first and then suddenly just everything happens all at once and the floor drops out and prices just crash down and you can actually see deflation, which is negative year over year inflation um, happen. That doesn't happen very often, but it did happen in late 2008, early 2009 uh, with that big bust. And so I think that if we get, you know, the system breaks uh, where the Fed has to come in and do major moves and stuff and central banks are coordinating all around the world, we could see a deflationary bust. That's not necessarily a good thing. It's good in the long run because it resets prices a little bit. Yep. but it's really scary to live through. So, you know, I just, I want to comment for a minute um, on the food inflation issue. Uh, I've, I've got a lot of contacts in the agriculture industry. Uh, I've worked in the agriculture real estate industry to, to some degree. And uh, in fact, I have some, some good friends and, and some partners in Colorado who farm in Eastern Colorado. 
And uh, I just talked to them the other day and they said, you know, listen, uh, everybody thinks that farmers right now are just raking it in, right? Because corn prices and wheat prices and, you know, just uh, typical uh, food commodities have gotten so much more expensive. But he said, we're, we're actually just fighting to stay alive because of inflation in our input costs. Yep. Mm-hmm. So it's everything that we have to put into the crop from, you know, fertilizer to seed to uh, pesticides to, you know, all the things that we have to do to maintain and grow our crops. They've all gotten exponentially more expensive. And so, yes, as you know, commodity prices have gone up, um, that helps us, but we're still struggling to stay alive just like we always have. And interesting enough, he said, where we're actually able to make money and be profitable is get this government subsidies, Mm -hmm. right? It's, it's the government that is actually keeping these farmers alive and the government needs them. We, as the United States need our producers to keep producing uh, and so our government is stepping in to make sure that there is an incentive for these guys to continue to do it. I mean, talk about a really rough business to be in. I mean, farming is not an easy business. Uh, I want to talk about energy for a minute. Um, y- you know, I've heard a lot of people recently talk about an energy crisis coming. We have Nord Stream 1, Nord Stream 2, uh, which was sabotaged. I've talked about that a little bit on my my podcast and episodes prior Um, We have uh, oil prices that who knows what they're going to do in the short term, long term. Most people tend to believe that they're going up, in fact, probably way up. Uh, You have the electric vehicle revolution, and we're trying to push for electric vehicles everywhere and for everyone in a relatively short period of time. Um, You know, that's going to put a tremendous strain on the on the grid. How do you see this energy thing playing out. And just to plant a seed, one of the things I just talked about on my last episode was uranium and whether or not nuclear becomes something that we go back to relatively quickly to try and fix the energy problems and the energy costs. I mean, here in the United States, our energy costs have gone up. But if you look at around the world, I mean, energy costs are up 60%, 80% year over year. Um, How do you see that playing out here? Yeah, lots of great points. So um, energy in general, I think, is one of the main best plays for this decade. So this is the decade of energy shortages and investing wisely in energy will be very lucrative, I think. In comparison to general stocks like tech stocks, I think are going to have kind of a generally not great decade. You know, bonds are are basically dead money in a lot of ways. Not not great when inflation is running as high as it is. I think we're going to see just generally this decade lots of volatility, lots of turmoil, um, geopolitical turmoil as well. Um, energy stocks, which have basically been left for dead up, per, leading up to this decade, are suddenly going to be, you know, uh, uh, what some term they're they're going to be very popular again for the first time. It's been it's been left for dead. ESG has has like tried to put a, a you know a pick in its heart, um, but but that's all going to change when people start dying because they can't get the energy, the natural gas to to uh, fuel their homes to you know turn their furnaces on in the winter that's when it gets serious and that's when you have revolts and that's and that's what's going on so that's like you said it's we, we don't face it that severely here in the US in fact things aren't that bad still here in the US um, things are terrible in Europe. Like there, there are there are reports in Europe of people's uh, utility bills. They're up ten times from where they were, and their energy costs were expensive to begin with because they're basically importing all of their energy uh, from other nations, primarily Russia, as well. So it's a it's a from an investment opportunity yes i think it's great i think we're going to see the narrative shift away from esg the the pendulum has swung way too far in that direction to the point where it's just silly and ridiculous and literally like people are dying and starving because of esg policies that are mandated by governments it's going to swing back in the other direction now it's going to take a long time though these things don't happen overnight it will take years and years and years and years and we're going to get back to a kind of a pro energy type agenda so what does that mean yes nuclear has been left for dead i'm already seeing and you probably are to lots of reports around the world of people like they're being forced to turn their nuclear reactors back on or to keep them on despite their promises that they made that they were going to shut them off to you know to to uh, scratch the ears of of some ESG narrative and so 
nuclear is going to be more pop that's that's the obvious solution to all of these things right I, I tweeted that a couple months ago if, if only there was a simple nuclear solution to europe's energy problems and there is they just have to turn their reactors back on again that will that will do a, a lot of good for them so yeah i think that that's a great investment thesis as well uh, i would look at uranium type stocks um, as a as a possibility Remember, uranium is just a commodity, right? So when the commodity booms, the producers boom even more. They're basically a high beta way to play. They do really well in boom times and they do really terribly in bad times. So you just have to know that those things are very cyclical. Oil producers are exactly the same, oil and natural gas. We're in boom times right now for those kind of companies. That's why I still have a couple in my Veilshire accounts because they're still in a bull market, even though everything else looks like it's fallen off a cliff. Um, so that's another good play. It kind of depends. You just have to remember anytime you're in the commodity space as an investor, they're very cyclical. And so you have to learn to take profits at the top and to, and, and so sell, sell down your position or completely out of your position and or short on the way down and ride these cycles. You don't just want to buy and hold almost any type of commodity or any type of commodity producer, uh, because in the long run, you're basically going on these huge roller coaster rides and you're left at about the same level you were before. Um, that said, there's a definite trend towards energy. So getting coming full circle to your original question, this is the decade to invest in energy and energy infrastructure. Things that were previously unpopular will become popular again. Um, we're going to see new kinds of energy. You know, there's there's types of, uh, you know, nuclear fusion is kind of the rage uh, right now. It, we'll see if that actually comes to fruition. If it does, that will be, I mean, it's nearly miraculous. So if they could, if they could make that work, that would be pretty fantastic. Um, I think Bitcoin for itself is going to fuse itself with energy producers and utilities companies in the coming decade as well. We're going to see integration of, of those things come together, which is counterintuitive to most people who don't understand Bitcoin, but it will so strongly incentivize energy production, uh, sources of cheap energy, energy efficiency, um, that I think we're going to see an actual like renaissance in the energy space. And it's going to be just unbelievable how much more energy we will have as humans globally uh, 10 years from now, 20 years from now. And I think Bitcoin will be kind of the primary uh, source of that. So let's, um, <clears throat> let's spend the last few minutes that we have together talking about both energy and Bitcoin. Um, and let's separate the two for a moment. It, what are your favorite names to play in energy over the course of the next decade? Sure. And, and do you think that energy is going to collapse along with this wave of deflation that may come when the credit systems or you know, bond markets break? Yeah. So I'll answer part two first. So if we have a deflationary bust where the world is panicking and the floor drops out, even energy will fall. That will be the last domino to fall. That's when you'll know we're in serious trouble. Basically, even the, the massive companies, the producers, the world, the world's engine that runs, whether it's humans or uh, individuals or corporations or nation states as a whole, when they basically slow down and grind to a halt, that's, that means that's just bad for the world and it's bad for energy. And so energy, I would expect oil prices to fall precipitously at that point. Um, so that, that, but it would be temporary. And I think at some point then when the, when the economy revs back up again, when we finally bottomed, when we start pulling out and we get into a new cycle, a new business cycle, that will be good again for energy and all these things will rev back up again. Again, I think because we're moving from peak globalization and we're decentralizing throughout the world, we all have to build up like the US, you know, US is a perfect example. We've been totally financializing ourselves for the last 80 years and we've lost all of our manufacturing base, the heartland, the, you know, Midwestern US where all of this great manufacturing, it's just been where it used to occur. It's just been gutted. There's hardly any industry left. I think all of that needs to come back to the United States, whether it's semiconductor or steel production and you know automotives whatever whatever industry is going to start moving back but that takes years and years and years to build that infrastructure out so that's a great play so infrastructure plays energy plays i think are going to do really well it's hard for me to pick an energy company for 10 years if i had to pick one energy company it's sort of a, a roundabout way to play i like a company and i own it just for full disclosure uh, personally and in our Veilshire accounts called Te texas pacific land trust tpl is the ticker 
Um, what that is, it's basically this this uh, company in Texas that over a hundred years ago was granted a massive swath of land throughout most of Texas, and it may even extend into some other states. And basically, they were just given this land, and what they do is they they earn income off of the land. So it's like a real estate play. They they happen to own tons of oil uh, related acreage as well in the Texas uh, region, and so what they can do is then rent out that land to oil producers and explorers and get royalties for that. And so basically, and then what they, their policy is, what I like is they're a scarcity play. So what they do is they just take their profits and they put a large chunk of those a little bit into a dividend, but the largest chunk they use into just buying back their own shares. And so you can just watch over time, over the last 20, 30 years, their share count just gets smaller, 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 smaller over time. Um, so if I had to own one uh, oil related uh, and energy related company, it would be TPL. The other company I own right now in my portfolios um, which I like is Occidental Petroleum. Uh, most people hadn't heard much of that, but it's it's become popular because Warren Buffett really likes that company. And Berkshire Hathaway has basically a Fed put, they have a Berkshire put underneath Occidental Petroleum. So anytime the price dips, they step in and buy more and more of that. And if you know Berkshire Hathaway, you know they have just a massive cash position. They're, they're world famous value investors. And so they just don't let the price dip anytime it dips too much, they buy more. I think they're eventually going to own the company. They're gonna take it over, be majority owners of it. And it'll just be another company under their huge behemoth conglomerate that they are as Berkshire Hathaway. And so it's kind of, I think at this point, kind of a no lose investment. Could it go down? Sure. If we have a deflationary bus, will it go down? Sure. But I think it recovers quickly. And I think Berkshire will just be scooping up shares. So I'm scooping up shares alongside of them. So do you see an environment, <clears throat> energy aside, where we have a sideways decade, like what Stanley Druckenmiller is talking about, where we don't see new highs in just about anything? I don't want to say everything, but in the major stock averages for about a decade. Do you see that as a possibility? I had been saying that since last year when stocks were still in their bull market that it's getting so frothy and valuations are getting so high and based on other metrics that we use, uh, John Hussman puts out really good stuff and some other like hedge fund managers put out really good reports. When you look at forward returns based on current price to sales ratios and other metrics, what are the long-term returns of these uh, these uh, stocks and bonds? And basically, as of the end of last year, and that's why I was like waving my arms and stuff about this, is, is saying stocks are slated to in the next 10 to 12 years. So back then, so that would make it to like 2033, the year 2031 to 2033, we'll have flat to negative returns over that 10 to 12 year period nominal that's nominal returns by the way when you factor in inflation so real returns they're actually deeply negative returns so we may see some nominal peaks in prices and i do think we're going to see kind of like how the 70s were where we saw these big ups and downs and big ups and downs and then in the end yeah we're about flat to slightly negative 10 years later uh, i think that's what's going to happen both in stocks and bonds because they had reached such insane valuations now we've seen such a massive pullback recently. And I, I, like I said, I still think it's gonna go lower, um, but we've taken a lot of that slack out early on. Uh, so there's a chance that we, we'll, have, we'll have room to run again, and then we're gonna come down. I would just expect most investors to, you know, this is not going to be like the 2010s. You can't just put a 60, 40 stock bond portfolio of low, you know, low fee index funds and expect to do well. That's fine if you want to do that, but I just don't think you're going to do very well and you're going to be pretty unhappy 10 years from now. You have to come up with more creative ways to invest this decade because it's just a very different decade. Okay, so let's talk about Bitcoin in that context over the next decade. Um, you know, you probably had one of the most realistic price targets on Bitcoin at the end of the year, which is about 50,000. Um, if my memory serves me right, I think you were 50,000 and one cent or something along those yeah, lines. Good memory. Um so, uh, you know, I, th I think we're close enough to the end of the year to say that price target is probably not going to happen. Uh, you're net short Bitcoin futures. So, you know, even at this point, I think you've probably changed your mind. Uh, lots of really credible guys, guys like Tom Lee uh, have come out and said, you know, their price targets for 2022 were $200,000. Lots of big, big, big bulls in the Bitcoin space. Uh, as we re record this podcast, I think I looked at the price just before we got on and we were about 18,300, give or take, um, down about a thousand bucks, uh, after the, uh, inflation data came out. Um, talk to me about where you see Bitcoin going over the course of this next decade. 
Um, personally, I'm a little worried that the uh, cycles have broken and that we may not see a new all-time high uh, in the next you know, two years or so. Um, with this macro outlook that uh, that you've got and that that I've got, I worry that Bitcoin is not going to see the adoption or have the importance that we believed it would just 12 months ago, uh, given everything that has happened. And, and a lot of people would argue maybe Bitcoin is the solution to the problem that we currently face. And although I tend to agree with that, I just think it's a very difficult environment for it to see its way through. Uh, how do you view Bitcoin and getting to a new all-time high or its performance over the next decade um, as opposed to, you know, the next 30, 40 years? Yeah, okay. So lots of great points here. So so first of all, uh, the 30,000-foot view. Bitcoin does extremely well when we're in periods of monetary expansion, and it does extremely poorly when we're in periods of monetary contraction generally. So what are we in right now? As everybody knows, you probably guessed we're in a period of monetary contraction, right? So lending is down, the monetary supply is coming down, banks are doing, central banks are doing uh, quantitative tightening. Uh, they're, they're choking the monetary supply. Banks are not lending out nearly as much as they would generally do when during boom times, they're in self-preservation mode. Um, people are defaulting on debts more and more increasingly people are paying off debts increasingly um, just to get out from under that all of that brings the monetary supply down when all of this happens bitcoin performs very poorly when the monetary supply is expanding so we're seeing credit expansion monetary debasement that's literally what bitcoin was created for so those are the times where it does really well so that's 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 my base case okay number two you talked about the Bitcoin cycles. I think the four-year Bitcoin cycle is dead. I think in the past cycles, those were very prominent and uh, important because the primary holders of Bitcoin were the Bitcoin miners. They took in a ton of it. And then what they would do is they would accumulate it until getting up close to the halving, and then they would sell a ton of it. Uh, and they, they're, they're the, their actions are what led to the overall market dynamics of Bitcoin. Since then, though, in the last couple of years, Bitcoin miners, public miners now have access to public funds so they can borrow money. Uh, they can they can uh, uh, create equity uh, in order to uh, fulfill their funding needs. They, they're, they're run more like a traditional commodity producer at this point, which is kind of interesting. So they still ebb and flow, but I don't think they control the Bitcoin uh, both in volume and in price action. So they don't hold as much Bitcoin as they used to, relatively speaking. It's, it continues to disperse among the public more. Um, um, and they're not as a and they're not so so their their market dynamics just don't affect the prices as much. So that's that's a quick thing to say. I think the four year cycle is dead. Bitcoin, even though it's still very small, it's sub five hundred billion in market cap right now. Um, it, it's it still trades, or I should say, it currently trades like a major asset class. And a ma all major asset classes are moved and swayed by macro dynamics. So as we have these, you know, big liquidity contraction events, as we have business cycles that are, you know, they're either expanding or they're, they're fading, they're contracting as well, Bitcoin will respond accordingly. So now we're coming back to my playbook, right? So, so, so everything's been lower. I still think Bitcoin goes lower. Momentum is still clearly bearish. At some point, the Fed will pause. When that pause happens, that's going to be seen as a good sign or a kind of an all clear for risk assets. I think we get a bump higher. I think Bitcoin will be included in that rally and we're going to see kind of a fierce rally in risk assets. I don't know how long it lasts. I'm saying somewhere probably between like two months to 12 months, we're going to see a pretty substantial rally before the market realizes that there's still huge trouble underneath the hood uh, and we have systemic problems and we have that last final drop. So could Bitcoin hit 50,000 by the end of the year? It really depends. If the Fed pauses, so say they raise rates on, on November 2nd and they go up another 75 bips and the federal funds rate is now at the high end 4%, they may say, you know what, let's pause right here and see and check out the effects. That may actually trigger the next kind of bull run in risk assets, that short-term trade that we're talking about. It actually could spike Bitcoin up to 50,000 before the end of the year. So I'm still saying it's possible that that happens. Unlikely though, right? Every day we're, we stay down in the depths here.
it's very unlikely it gets that high by the end of the year, but it completely depends on the timing of the Fed pause. Um, then I think it goes lower again. And I still think, you know, risk assets in general are going to do really terribly and Bitcoin's going to get pulled down, even though it's not a risk asset, it's still going to get pulled down with the other risk assets into 2023 until we finally find our bottom. And then we're off to the races again, starting the next business cycle and the next monetary um, uh, expansion. Uh, and that's going to come. And that next round of QE by the central banks is going to be ginormous. It's going to be very impactful. It's going to blow up another huge, massive asset bubble, I think, uh, before the next huge deflationary bust that happens years, years later. So that'll be a problem to worry about another day. But that's kind of the playbook I'm looking at. The timing is the hard part, right? But I can yeah, I can see it in my mind where, where we're going to go, what the Fed's going to do, what the markets will do, how they'll react. I just, the hard part is trying to figure out the timing. It could happen in a couple of weeks. It may not happen for uh, several months from now, but it, it, I think it will happen. So if we lived in a world where the NASDAQ, the S&P, and the Dow <clears throat> does not put in a new high for the next 10 years, do you think Bitcoin puts in a new high in the next 10 years? I do, actually. Um, I'm I'm more um, optimistic about Bitcoin, m- mainly because of the metrics I look at. Well, first of all, I think these other... It's, it's sort of a it's sort of a funny question. I think risk assets are going to hit new all-time highs. The next round of QE that hits, once we bottom and start up the next cycle, I do think we hit new nominal highs in all of those things. Basically, because that money has to go somewhere, and I think they're going to absolutely flood the markets with new monetary supply. Um, and I think that that will be very good for those assets. So I I do think that they will. But then I think they're going to bust again. Is the problem? It's not a healthy cycle. These are sort of like end stage things of this Keynesian ep- economic experiment. Credit expansion can only expand so far. Become it just becomes this before it becomes a huge mountain of debt that's just absolutely unpayable, and it just stifles the growth of companies. And basically every major nation is under this curse right now of this massive mountain of debt that it can never repay. So that's going to hurt growth until the system breaks. Um, So I do think they're going to artificially pump up the prices as much as they can, and that will be net good for Bitcoin. I still follow the things that are important to me regarding the Bitcoin network is our number of users expanding, our use cases expanding still, is that is hash rate expanding. Um, All of those things are still expanding fantastically at this rate, even with these super low prices. So I think at some point um, we're going to make up for lost time and the price of Bitcoin will, I think, just take off and make up for lost time from the last cycle, which I think was cut short because of the ban of Chinese of of miners in China. Uh, And then we got into this recessionary type conditions. Bitcoin sniffed out that there was going to be trouble under the economic hood all the way back in November of 2021 and started to descend. Um, uh, I think that last move higher was cut way short and we're going to make up for lost time in the next cycle. Um, very interesting thoughts, Jeff. Uh, I I'm always so impressed with your thoughtfulness about all of these things. And it's a really complex world to navigate. Um, I, I don't envy your job at all being a a fund manager and, and looking at these, you know, assets and trying to forecast what they're going to do both short-term and long-term. It's a very difficult thing to do. And, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of people come to me and say, you know, I want to get involved in trading or I want to get involved in investing. And um, it, it's always this sexy allure, thinking that you get to sit in front of a computer and push buttons and, you know, you print money. Much harder to navigate than what anybody <laughs> would imagine. Um, so thank you for sharing your wisdom and experience with us, your thoughtfulness. Um, I'm forever grateful that you continue to come on my podcast and share with my my viewers what, uh, what your thoughts are. I mean, this is, this is important stuff. And I think that, uh, over the course of the next few years, this information for the average person or the professional investor is vitally important to survival. Uh, I think this is a pretty treacherous environment. So thank you so much for that. I want to give you the last word, anything that you want to, you want to part with. Just to be careful out there, I still think, you know, I, I, I keep hearing people calling market bottoms and getting optimistic, I think too soon. And I think we're going to see lower lows before uh, the Fed actually does pause. And, you know, we start this little short term rally. Just be careful out there. It's not, I keep saying all the time on Twitter, it's not too late to hedge. And in the easiest way to hedge for just regular people, just increase your cash position. Like if you have a 401k or an IRA and you're hundred percent invested in stocks and bonds, 
there's nothing wrong with with moving that allocation down to 80% and having 20% cash or 50% and moving, you know, 50% cash, 50% stocks and bonds or go all cash and just sit and wait, you know, wait until it looks like the dust has, has cleared. So um, it's, I really hate watching people, especially older people who are in retirement or near retirement, watching their 401ks, their life savings go down, down, down. Um, you can do things to prevent it. It's not too late. Um, and, um, and I'd say, keep listening to Jordan, that I, Jordan, I really respect what you do here, the way you're just sharing your knowledge and your wisdom with people and getting great guests on your show. I mean, just trying to help the regular person survive and navigate this decade, I think is, is almost priceless in this decade because we are not living in the easy days anymore. Like this is going to be a tough decade for sure. And you have to be walking around with your eyes wide open because things change quickly uh, and huge geopolitical uh, turmoil has effects on your portfolios as well. So just, just be aware of what's going on, be safe. Uh, and, and Jordan and I will both try to help uh, your audience uh, do the best we can in this coming decade. Jeff, I really, really appreciate that. Uh, those are very kind words and, and humbling words as well. Um, I just want to encourage any listeners out there that uh, want to get in contact with you, Jeff, how do they get in contact with you? And wh whether it's just about your knowledge or it's about your separately managed accounts or your hedge fund, uh, how do people find you? Sure. If you want to learn more about how I manage money, I obviously do it pretty differently than most financial planners and investment advisors. I manage my client accounts more like I manage my hedge fund. So we hedge, we actively short markets when I think things are going down, which means we tend to do well in bear markets as well as bull markets. If you want to learn more about that, uh, send me an email at info at valeshire.com and I'll get back to you uh, personally. And then uh, I'm on Twitter all the time. So my handle is at Valeshire Cap. You can find me on there. We're doing Twitter spaces a lot and I'm you know, tweeting my macro thoughts and investment ideas out there a lot. So feel free to find me there. Awesome. Jeff, thanks so much. And to all of our listeners, thanks for watching. If you've made it this far and appreciate the content, make sure to give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and don't forget to go to savantreport.com and sign up for our free newsletter. Thanks everybody. And we will see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you.